So in today's video, we're going to be covering anemia. And anemia is a topic that absolutely sucks to learn. You do need to be familiar with anemia. And in real clinical practice, you'll probably only see a few types of anemia in your life, unless you're a hematologist slash oncologist. However, on USMLE and Comlex, anemia is high yield. It's literally all over your exam. The reason being is that anemia has so many different types, right? There's so many different types of microcytic and normocytic and macrocytic and blah, 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 blah. It's nuts. They love showing you pictures on your exam and making you infer from that picture what type of anemia we're talking about or what type of blood disorder we're talking about. There are literally hundreds of ways they could get after this and that's why you need to know anemia cold. So what are we gonna cover today? First, we're gonna start with the kind of overview slide that will show you the three different ways that we categorize anemia. Then we're gonna talk about lab findings. Not all of these have really high yield lab findings, but where I think it's pertinent is how you use the labs to differentiate one type of anemia from another. So we'll cover what the labs are where appropriate. We'll talk about all high yield clinical associations. So some of these anemias are related to really, really high yield diseases, and I'll point those out as we go through. The last thing that we're gonna to do today, which I really love, are just the pictures of the red blood cells. And depending on what type of anemia or what type of blood disease we're talking about, the red blood cell changes accordingly. And you need to be familiar with the pictures because one of the board favorites is that all they'll do is show you a picture and then they'll ask you a question. So you gotta know what you're looking at. So that's sort of the overview of today's lecture. And with that said, let's talk about how anemia is classified. So first I wanna start and just take a step back and. and kind of give a general definition of anemia. So anemia is when there is a decreased or hypofunctioning red blood cell or hemoglobin. And in all of the cases of anemia, regardless of whether we're talking about a low, normal, or high MCV, anemia is pretty much gonna present the same way. It's gonna just be constant, chronic, unexplained fatigue. So if you see that, that's your cue that we're talking about anemia. Now the way that anemia is classified is according to something called the MCV, which stands for the mean corpuscular volume. And when that mean corpuscular volume is below 80, it's considered low. So let's first start by talking about the diseases that we're gonna go through. Of course, I'll go through these one at a time, but again, this is our overview slide. So what you see here in this diagram is kind of the composition of hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is broken into four subunits. And in each of those subunits, you have a heme group with an iron at the center. So on the right, you see kind of what that looks like chemically, and then on the left, you see the 3D representation. So four heme groups, and at the center of each of those heme groups are iron. When all four of those subunits are bound together, you have one hemoglobin molecule. So that's what we're talking about. Now, in a low MCV disease state, any one of these um, components of hemoglobin can be messed up. So in the case of iron deficiency anemia, which is our first type of low MCV anemia, we, uh, we lack iron. So we lack that iron that sits at the center of the four heme groups. In sideroblastic anemia, we have a problem with heme itself. So heme production in the porphyrin pathway is gonna be messed up. And as such, we're not gonna have functioning hemoglobin because those four heme groups are, are not being produced correctly. And then in thalassemia, we have a problem with the actual gene that codes for the heme. So the problem with um, one of the alpha genes or one of the beta genes. Um, also included in the low MCV group is anemia of chronic disease. I will touch on that again by itself, but that doesn't really relate to that diagram that you just saw. And anemia of chronic disease can actually be considered um, low mean corpuscular volume, but also normal mean corpuscular volume. So this is a great segue into the normal diseases. Anything with a mean corpuscular volume from 80 to 99 is considered normal. So it's not low, it's not high, it's normal. So anemia of chronic disease can be normal or low. Um, my experience is that usually you'll see it on the normal side, but it can be low. The other diseases in this normal section that we're gonna talk about are paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, um, G6PD deficiency, and hereditary spherocytosis. Then we're gonna talk about high MCV diseases. So any time the mean corpuscular volume is 100 or higher, we're talking about a high MCV. 
and these are classically your B12 and folate deficiency. So here's the overview of today's lecture, and I'm going to go through each of these individually, touch on all the high yields, throw a little mnemonics, and uh, we'll be on our way. We'll be learning anemia together. Um, one thing I do want to point out before we get started is that this is not an all-inclusive list. There are other lower yield diseases not on this slide. If you are interested in learning about those, I would refer you to Pathoma. Sitar does an absolutely wonderful job of summarizing all of those. I'm just not going to waste your time. So let's start from the left side and work our way across the slide towards the right. So we'll do all the lows, then all the normals, and all the highs. So with that said, we're going to start with iron deficiency anemia. So iron deficiency anemia is the most common cause of anemia. Right there, right off the bat, you got a high yield point. Most common cause of anemia is iron deficiency anemia. So this will classically present in someone with some type of bleeding. If you have a patient who is iron deficient anemic, you know, iron deficiency anemia, and you don't know why. If it's an older male, it's colon cancer until proven otherwise. In a female, it could be related to her menstrual period, but, you know, that remains to be seen because there's lots of different causes of iron deficiency anemia, and that'll be your job to investigate once you're a clinician. But for the purposes of USMLE and Comlex, let's talk about some labs. So the labs that we'll see in iron deficiency anemia are low ferritin, high transferrin slash TIBC. I'm going to use those words interchangeably. You'll have hypochromia. And again, we talked about a microcytic mean corpuscular volume. So Ferritin is the storage form of iron. That's how I want you to think of it. So in when you're iron deficient, you're going to have decreased ferritin because you don't want to store iron. You want more iron free in the body. So the storage form will be low. Transferrin slash TIBC, which stands for total iron binding capacity, is basically something that represents the body's willingness to want iron or to have iron. So in an iron deficient state, we want more iron. And therefore, the TIBC slash transferrin, which carries the iron around, is going to be high because we're trying to get more iron free in the body. Hypochromia is kind of like a pale, a palish color of the red blood cell that you'll see on a slide. And the reason that it's pale is because when you're iron deficient, your hemoglobin is, is really not working. So you have less hemoglobin, which appears hypochromic when you actually look at a red blood cell. And then we said it's microcytic, it's uh, mean corpuscular volume is going to be less than 80. So those are your labs. And the labs are really high yield for iron deficiency anemia because a lot of times on your exam, they'll just give you labs. They'll describe a patient who probably has some questionable bleeding or you know some some type of bleeding disorder and they'll want you to pick iron deficiency anemia so be familiar with these labs be familiar with ferritin being storage transferrin slash tibc being like the the transport or the body's willingness to want more iron hypochromia the paleness of the red blood cell because the hemoglobin is just simply decreased or not working and it's microcytic so high yield stuff right there so a high yield disease association is plumber vincent syndrome so plumber vincent syndrome is a triad of three things, esophageal webs, iron deficiency anemia, and dysphagia. Memorize it, guys. Three things, esophageal webs, iron deficiency anemia, and dysphagia. And the mnemonic here is WID. And the reason that WID is the mnemonic is because plumber sounds like plumber. And when do you need a plumber to fix your toilet? When I diarrhea. So when I diarrhea, I need to call a plumber to unclog the toilet. WID for when I diarrhea. WID for Webb's iron dysphagia. It's a triad. It's plumber Vincent syndrome. Don't forget it. That is iron deficiency anemia. Here's a beautiful slide showing hypochromia. So hypochromia are slightly paler red blood cells, again, because hemoglobin is just not in its normal state. This is what that looks like. Compare this to a normal red blood cell, and you'll definitely notice the difference. But this is hypochromia. That's iron deficiency anemia. So we're already done one. Let's talk about sideroblastic anemia. So sideroblastic anemia is an abnormality of heme production in the porphyrin pathway. And what you see on the left part of the slide is the porphyrin pathway. You do need to know the porphyrin pathway. I'm not going to go through it right now, but I, again, I would refer you to Pathoma and Sitar, who does an excellent job covering this. But what I want you to be familiar with is what I've circled and marked in red here. So sideroblastic anemia, the most common cause is an ALA synthetase deficiency, and that's the enzyme shown there in red. The other causes of sideroblastic anemia can be lead poisoning and administration of some drugs, which are going to um, indirectly inhibit ALA synthase. So Let's kind of go through this one at a time. When this is the mitochondria that you're seeing shown there in that light blue. And in the mitochondria, you have the ultimate production of heme. Now, if you have an ALA synthetase deficiency, you can't produce heme. So there, there's going to be decreased heme. Now, what happens is heme combines with iron in the mitochondria and 
that's kind of how the heme and the iron get linked up for use in hemoglobin. But since heme is not being produced, you're going to have iron sitting around inside the mitochondria. And we're going to come back to that in just a second. But iron's going to be built up because it can't combine with heme. Now, besides an ALA synthetase deficiency, which is a genetic deficiency of the enzyme that ultimately leads to the production of heme, the other ways that you can get sideroblastic anemia are from lead and from the drug isoniazid. So isoniazid causes a B6 deficiency. So isoniazid basically inhibits B6. And that's important because B6 is a cofactor in the step that uses ALA synthase. So isoniazid decreases B6, which decreases ALA synthase, which decreases heme. When heme is decreased, there's no heme, so hemoglobin doesn't work and you become anemic. And then iron builds up in the mitochondria, which is bad. You get iron overload in the mitochondria. The other way is, is to be um, lead poisoned. So lead inhibits the enzyme ferroketolase. Um, ferroketolase is one of the enzymes also involved in the production of heme. So in some instances, if the, pa the patient has lead poisoning, ferroketolase won't work, you won't get heme, hemoglobin won't work, so you become anemic, and then iron builds up in the cell. These are all various causes of sideroblastic anemia. So spend some time on this slide, rewind the video, and look at what I said. But when this happens, heme doesn't get produced. Now, I told you that when heme doesn't get produced, it can't combine with iron. And if iron can't combine with heme to be exported and used in hemoglobin, then you have an iron building up in the mitochondria that looks like this. And the reason that this is important is because one of the ways they go after sideroblastic anemia on USMLE and Comlex is they'll show you a picture of something that is stained with a Prussian blue stain that looks like this. So this is called a ringed sideroblast. And what you're seeing, all those blue specks, are iron accumulating in the mitochondria around the nucleus. Iron cannot get out of the mitochondria. It's accumulating and it, it is, it's causing what's called a ringed sideroblast. So you see that picture, it's sideroblastic anemia because iron is building up in the mitochondria. It has no heme to combine with, probably because ALA synthetase isn't working, but possibly because the patient is a TB patient on isoniazid, or they have lead poisoning because they live in a house that was built before 1972, secondary to lead paint. Whatever it is, it's sideroblastic anemia. So ringed sideroblast looks like this, know it cold, that's sideroblastic anemia. Um, and your labs, you're going to have increased iron because iron is accumulating, right? We got iron overload, increased ferritin because iron is accumulating and we're trying to store it and decrease TIBC slash transferrin because the body's like, no, 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 I don't want any more iron. That is sideroblastic anemia. So we're done with the first two. Let's talk about thalassemia. So thalassemia has historically given everyone nightmares. Thalassemia is not fun to learn. I'm going to do my best to simplify it, but I'm going to be honest and forthcoming. Thalassemia is hard. It sucks. So spend some time on thalassemia. So thalassemia is an abnormality in hemoglobin production. Basically, you've got different types of genes that code for for heme production. You have four alpha genes and two beta genes. And the way that thalassemia works is that the deletion is given in the name. So alpha thalassemia means that an alpha gene was deleted. Beta thalassemia means, you know, one or more of the beta genes was deleted. So that's how the name, the naming convention works. So let's start with alpha thalassemia. So if you have one deletion in an alpha gene, you're asymptomatic, doesn't matter. You're probably fine. Two deletion of two alpha genes, you're going to have a mild anemia. That's the one that they go after the most on boards. And, and I'll come back to that in just a second. Three deletions, you're going to have severe anemia. And four deletions, it's, it's hydrops fatalis. It is incompatible with life. So baby is just not going to make it. Now let's go back to the two deletions of two alpha genes. That's the mild anemia. Um, this one is what they go after on boards. And the reason is because it creates a mild anemia, that anemia can be confused with other types of anemia. So they want to make sure that you understand thalassemia and that you're going to identify it on USMLE and Comlex. So, so this is what they like to go after. Um, what I want you to know is that there's two types of alpha thalassemias with the double deletion. There's a cis deletion and a trans deletion. Now the cis deletion is going to, as the name implies, occur on the same chromosome. The trans deletion is going to occur on different chromosomes. Um, Asian patients typically have the cis deletion and African patients usually have the trans deletion. One deletion of a beta gene will cause beta thalassemia minor, which is going to be asymptomatic pretty much. Um, two deletions of a beta gene causes beta thalassemia major. And in that case, you have production of hemoglobin A2. So 
because both of the betas are deleted, you have two A's. That's where the name comes from, I think. So lots of hemoglobin A2. I would know that. And then I would know that there is this association, which is called a chipmunk facey um, or chipmunk faces, chipmunk faces. So basically what's happening is because you have beta thalassemia major, hematopoiesis is royally screwed. What the body tries to do is produce um, blood cells in other locations. One of them is on the skull because there's a lot of surface area of bone there. So the skull tries to do hematopoiesis and then the skull gets really deformed. And the way that it's classically described is as a chipmunk facey. So I guess you look like a chipmunk. I don't really see that um, similarity, but that is what it's, it's said to look like. Um, the way that I remember this is that beta thalassemia major reminds me of the drum major who wears that hilarious funky hat which sits right on the skull so beta thalassemia major looks like the drum major the drum major wears the hat on the skull that reminds me that um there's extra medullary hematopoiesis at the skull which causes chipmunk facies in beta thalassemia major the way that i remember alpha thalassemia is that it's all the a's so the asian and african patients with the deletions will have alpha thalassemia and then beta thalassemia major looks like drum major extra medullary hematopoiesis which means that it's hematopoiesis occurring outside of the medullary portion of bone it occurs on the skull of the face which is going to cause chipmunk facies so that is thalassemia um, i think this is a really easy way of breaking it all down but i think you should definitely go through this slide a couple times and get comfortable with the different types of thalassemias because they are particularly high yield we're going to move on and talk about anemia of chronic disease now. So anemia of chronic disease is an anemia that is secondary to some type of chronic inflammation. So basically, the body is unable to differentiate if it's getting destroyed from a really bad infection or if it's just some type of chronic inflammation or chronic inflammatory disease that causes inflammation in the body. So this could be like someone has the bubonic plague and it's actually infected by something terrible and deadly. And on the other hand, it could be something like rheumatoid arthritis, which is just a disease that causes chronic inflammation in the body. So from the body's perspective, it doesn't know which of the two it is, but in either scenario, it activates um, an acute inflammatory product called hepcidin. And hepcidin goes to the gut and tells the gut, yo, we're getting screwed by chronic, chronic inflammation right now. And I don't know if it's infectious or not, but either way, we got to hide iron. Now, the reason that it's hiding iron is because infectious processes use iron to multiply. So when the body is experiencing chronic inflammation, one of the pro-inflammatory mediators that come out is hepcidin. And hepcidin's job is to go to the gut and say, yo, chill on the iron absorption so we have decreased iron absorption in the gut and then it's to go to to ferritin and say hey ferritin bro you got to increase your iron storage because we got to hide the iron in the event that this is something truly infectious now again and i'm stressing this because this is very important it doesn't matter if it's an actual infection or if it's some type of disease that just causes chronic inflammation the body can't tell the difference because as evolved and amazing as our bodies are they're really quite stupid when it comes to anemia so hepcidin causes decreased iron absorption from the gut and increased iron storage in the body because of this the labs are going to be decreased iron because we're hiding iron, increased ferritin because we're storing slash hiding iron in the form of ferritin, and decreased transferrin slash TIBC because the body doesn't want iron. It's trying to hide it. So that's anemia of chronic disease. And the three things that I want you to remember, in addition to an actual infection, are kidney disease, autoimmunity, and anything rheumatologic. So any of those things will cause anemia of chronic disease. So like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic kidney disease, whatever. And the way that I remember this is that anemia of chronic disease, chronic disease, CD, you listen to CDs in the car, car, K-A-R, I know I spelled it wrong, whatever, kidney disease, autoimmunity, rheumatologic diseases. So we listen to the CD, we listen to the chronic disease in the car, K-A-R, kidney, autoimmunity, anything rheumatologic. So again, infections, chronic diseases, doesn't matter. The body is stupid and wants to hide iron. That's anemia of chronic disease. That's, that's a normal MCV and a low MCV. Now let's talk about paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria or PNH. So this is caused by a defect in something called the PIGA gene, right? The PIGA gene. And the PIGA gene encodes two things, CD55 and CD59. CD55, CD55 is also known as decay accelerating factor, aka DAF. So 
when you have an abnormality or a defect in this PIGA gene, you don't get CD55 and you don't get CD59. Now, how does that contribute to paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria? Well, let's say that this is a red blood cell. Normally, the red blood cell will have these two products on it, right? It'll have CD55, known as decay accelerating factor, and it will have CD59. These are both encoded by the PIGA gene. When the PIGA gene is messed up, you don't get these. So that's what I want you to know so far. Now, in complement, complement usually works like this. There's the gene C3 convertase, which converts C3 into its C3B active form. C3B um, activates the membrane attack complex, which causes lysis of cells. Now, normally the red blood cell has CD55 and CD59 on it. And what these things do is inhibit C3 convertase. So C3 convertase activates all its shit. And that thing comes to the red blood cell and says, red blood cell, my name is compliment. I am here to destroy you. And the red blood cell says, mm, not so fast, bro. Here's CD55, here's CD59, and these two things slap C3 convertase across the face and inhibit it. That's what normally happens. But if you have a defect in the PIGA gene and you don't have CD55 and you don't have CD59, complement will occur and lyse the red blood cell. So this is what's happening in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Now, the way that I remember this is there are three things you need to know about PNH. And the mnemonic is literally PNH. You get pancytopenia, so decrease in all the types of cells. Um, there's a negative Coombs test because a Coombs test measures an autoantibody, and there is no autoantibody in this, in this instance. And this occurs when you sleep at night, and I use the H as this occurs when you're hibernating. So um, as a really quick aside, the reason that this typically occurs at night, we believe this is because at night patients hypoventilate, which causes some type of um, acidic change in the body that causes more complement to occur. That's way beyond the scope of USMLE and Comlex, so don't worry about that, but I'm just trying to you know, make more memory connections for you guys here. So paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So the name sort of gives away what it does, but just remember PNH, pancytopenia, negative Coombs, occurs during hibernation, aka occurs during sleep, and this is a defect in the PIGA gene, which knocks out CD55 and CD59, so complement goes unchecked and lyses red blood cells which of course causes anemia. So that's PNH. Not too bad, right? Let's talk about G6PD deficiency. So G6PD deficiency is pretty high yield. So what happens, this is, this is due to oxidative stress being imposed on red blood cells. So normally in the hexo shunt, you have glutathione that turns into reduced glutathione. And what mediates that for the glutathione being turned into reduced glutathione is the NADPH. NADPH turns glutathione into reduced glutathione. And then reduced glutathione goes around and it destroys free radicals, which usually cause oxidative damage. So that's the normal. Now, there's an enzyme called G6PD, which turns NADP into NADPH. So as you can see, if there's no G6PD, so if you have a G6PD deficiency, you can't make NADPH, which means you cannot reduce glutathione, which means you cannot cleanse free radicals. And if free radicals are running around like crazy madmen, like radical madmen, as you see here, then they're going to cause a lot of damage in the body. And that's what happens when you have a G6PD deficiency. Now, what's really high yield to know for your exams are two things. One is that certain types of oxidative stress will cause the formation of free radicals. So someone who has G6PD deficiency might be asymptomatic for a while, but then all of a sudden they're going to incur some type of oxidative stress. And because they have a deficiency in the G6PD enzyme, they can't clean up all the free radicals that are forming as a result of this sudden burst of oxidative stress. So what is it that causes the oxidative stress? Well, the mnemonic instead of G6P is D6P. And D6P stands for dapsone, sulfa, and primaquine. I also include fava beans, but everybody knows that. Like, fava beans is the biggest buzzword for G6P deficiency, G6PD deficiency. So it's not part of my mnemonic, but everyone pretty much knows that. So dapsone, sulfa drugs, primaquine, fava beans. If a patient has that stuff, ingests that stuff, takes the drug, and they're G6PD deficient, they're going to become um, anemic. It's going to be a normocytic anemia. So look for the clinical vignette where the patient is taking some antibiotic and all of a sudden they become anemic. It's probably a sulfa drug. They're being treated for malaria and all of a sudden they become anemic. 
it's Prima Queen. They go to some foreign country and they eat the local food and then they become anemic. It's fava beans. They have an infection and then they become anemic. Might be G6PD deficiency. How they'll get you on the test is with these super high yield pictures. So please know these pictures cold. What you're seeing here on the left are Heinz bodies and on the right are bite cells. So basically in a G6PD deficiency, um, the patient will have denatured hemoglobin as a result of the oxidative stress causing the anemia. And when that accumulates, it accumulates in little clumps, which are called Heinz bodies. You see them on the left. Now the body doesn't like Heinz, Heinz bodies. So what it does is it sends macrophages and says, yo, there's Heinz bodies over there. Go get them, get rid of them. So the macrophages literally walk up to the red blood cell and take a bite out of that red blood cell. And what you see is called a bite cell and that's shown in the right. So it looks like a red blood cell with literally like a bite taken out of it, hence the name bite cells. So if you see Heinz bodies or you see bite cells, it's a G6PD deficiency. Um, know again that G6PD deficiency is caused by oxidative stress due, the, due to the inability to reduce glutathione, which means free radicals are roaming free as a result of the oxidative stressors, which causes Heinz bodies and bite cells. So that's G6PD deficiency. Let's wrap up the uh, normocytic anemias by talking about hereditary spherocytosis. So hereditary spherocytosis is due to a dysfunctional red blood cell skeleton protein. And there are a couple proteins that can cause this. It can be to, due to dysfunctional spectrin, anchorin, or some type of band. So it'll say something like band 3.1 or band, and then it'll list a number. Whatever that is, it's hereditary spherocytosis. So the red blood cell relies on these proteins to build its kind of perimeter. And I love this diagram because it shows you that um, from the molecular point of view, when you lack those proteins, what should be that normal biconcave shape of the red blood cell turns into a sphere hence the name spherocytosis. So when you have that sphere, a couple things happen. One is that the red blood cell loses its ability to pass through the spleen appropriately. And as a result of that, red blood cells are gonna accumulate and become stuck in the spleen. So you get splenomegaly. You're gonna have a Coombs negative test because again, there's no autoantibodies here. So Coombs is, that's what it's testing for. There's no autoantibodies. It's gonna be Coombs negative. You're gonna get an increased indirect bilirubin and jaundice because of extravascular hemolysis. So these red blood cells are gonna be destroyed extravascularly. Um, and you get jaundice as a result of that. The highest yield thing that I want you to know is that you get Howell Jolly bodies shown here in that image. So usually what happens in the spleen is that red blood cells lose their nuclear remnants. In, this, in the situation of her hereditary spherocytosis, the spleen cannot remove the nuclear remnants. So you literally have basophilic nuclear remnants clumping up in little balls and staying in the red blood cell inappropriately when in fact they should have been removed in the spleen but they couldn't be because the spleen is really screwed up because these sphere shaped red blood cells are accumulating in the spleen and causing problems with the spleen so that's hereditary spherocytosis and that wraps up all of the high yield uh, normocytic anemias that you should know about the last category we're going to get into are the um, MCVs that are high, so they're going to be 100 or higher, and these are just B12 and folate deficiency. These are particularly high yield, so I really want you to pay attention here. B12 deficiency, um, I think to understand this, we should start with a diagram of the stomach. So there's your stomach, and somewhere near the top of the stomach, you have your gastric parietal cells, which I marked there as GPC. And if you followed the intestines, you would eventually reach the ileum. So for simplicity's sake, I marked the end of this diagram as the ileum. What happens in B12 deficiency, or you know what, let's start with what happens normally. So the gastric parietal cells will secrete something known as intrinsic factor, or IF. And when you take in B12, and I show B12 there coming down the esophagus, intrinsic factor and B12 bind together and form this complex. And they pass through the intestines together in this complex until they reach the ileum. And at the ileum, the ileum breaks the connection and absorbs the B12. So B12 is absorbed at the ileum, that's really, really high yield. And intrinsic factor complexes with B12, which is secreted by the gastric parietal cells. So the most common cause of B12 deficiency is what's called, called pernicious anemia. So in pernicious anemia, you have autoimmune destruction of gastric parietal cells. And when that happens, the gastric parietal cells don't make intrinsic factors. So you have a decrease in IF. And when that happens, you can't complex IF to B12. So you have a decrease in that complex. And then when that happens, you can't absorb B12 at the ileum. So you have a B12 deficiency. B12 and folate, 
but we're talking about B12 right now. B12 and folate are both involved in DNA synthesis. So it's very important that you get these substances in in order to make um, DNA. And that's where sort of the anemia ties in. So pernicious anemia is the most common cause of B12 deficiency. And as you'll see when we briefly touch on folate, you need folate because you don't get a lot of folate stores. But B12, the body has so many B12 stores that it can literally, it's very hard to become B12 deficient by not eating B12 because you've stored up so much that lasts such a long time. So the number one cause of B12 deficiency is in fact this autoimmune condition called pernicious anemia. Something that's really high yield that I would like to point out is that because B12 is absorbed at the ileum, another type of, another cause of B12 deficiency would be if we knocked out the ileum. So any type of GI disease that knocks out the ileum or, you know, trauma, surgery, whatever, you can't absorb B12, you'll become B12 deficient. So that's really high yield. So what do the labs look like? In both B12 and folate deficiency, you have an increase in something called homocysteine. But only in B12 deficiency do you also have an increase in something called MMA, that's methylmalonic acid. This is really high yield because sometimes on exams, they'll make you differentiate between B12 and folate deficiency. So what gives it away is the increased MMA. That always goes with B12 deficiency. So how do we remember this? MMA to me is mixed martial arts. And here's a picture of an MMA fighter kicking someone right in the ilium. And in my head, I'm saying they're knocking out the ilium, which is what absorbs B12. So if you have MMA, you have B12 deficiency. That's really, really high yield. Another thing, taking this a step further, is that one of the symptoms of a B12 deficiency are neuropsychiatric symptoms. Subacute combined degeneration is what you'll see on exams. And the reason is because B12 is used... Uh, in the synthesis of the myelin sheath. And without the myelin sheath, you're going to get neuropsychiatric symptoms like numbness, tingling, lack of reflexes, etc. So that's, that's one of the symptoms that you'll see really far down the line after the anemia once you're B12 deficient. And the way that I remember that is, again, our MMA fighter is now kicking somebody in the head, which is causing neuropsychiatric symptoms. So that's B12 deficiency. We got MMA kicking them in the ileum. Ileum is what absorbs B12. So MMA elevated is B12 deficiency normal MMA for folate deficiency. And then again, the MMA fighter kicking someone in the head reminds me of the neuropsychiatric symptoms as a result of that elevated MMA causing damage to the myelin sheath, um, which causes neuropsychiatric symptoms. So that's B12 deficiency. In both B12 deficiency and folate deficiency, not only do you have an elevated homocysteine, but you have this hyper segmented neutrophils. This is a very, very high yield image, which is why I blew it up and put it in really nice quality because you have to be able to recognize this. If you see this picture, it could be either B12 or folate deficiency. You don't really know yet. You're going to have to look at other things like is MMA elevated? Do they maybe have pernicious anemia? How's their diet? Are they alcoholic? Things like that. Um, you'll kind of go from there, but where you start, if you see this picture, it's macrocytic, it's megaloblastic, it's going to be B12 or folate deficiency. Now, I don't have a slide for folate deficiency because folate deficiency is pretty straightforward. Folate deficiency is a macrocytic, right, 100 or higher MCV. It's a macrocytic megaloblastic anemia that's usually caused because of a nutritional deficiency. So unlike B12, which is we have lots of stores of B12 in our body, a folate deficiency is going to be because the person has terrible nutrition. So like an alcoholic who you find on the bench might have a folate deficiency, things like that. So if you th folate, think more nutritional, B12, think more pernicious anemia. If you see neuro symptoms or an elevated MMA, it's B12 deficiency. If you see hypersegmented neutrophils, it could be either. So that's it, guys. We've gone through all the types of anemia. I know I kind of flew through this, but I threw in mnemonics. I talked about labs. I showed you pictures. And I think this is a really, really good start. If you combine this video with maybe something like um, Pathoma's video, and I believe it's actually two videos on Pathoma because it really takes a while to go through anemia, then you should be pretty golden when it comes to answering these questions.